Welcome back to Sound 101. I'm Andrew from DD Microphones, and with me, next to me, is DD Steve. I'm here. What's up? Well, you shaved the mustache, but we have to move forward and not discuss that anymore. And because DD Steve's in the house, that means it's mailbag. So we got our first question, and it is from Jami J Singh, who is actually going to win a vlog. Because if you drop a question down in the comment section below, and it is chosen as the number one question for these types of episodes, you win a vlog. I mean, it's that simple. You just gotta ask us stuff. That's and it. You could win. So the question from Jami J Singh is this, and is to you, Steve. All right. Can you use an ambisonics mic to make a stereo output more immersive? And what does that workflow look like? Yes, you can absolutely use Ambisonics microphones to create probably the most immersive stereo output option. And I think the workflow would look something like this. You'd start with your Ambisonic microphone and you would use this microphone to record four analog signals. Dump those into Pro Tools and apply a plugin by Facebook 360. It's called their Spatial Workstation. Remarkably powerful software for something that's entirely free. So good on you, Facebook. Now, once you've used this plugin, you can basically create a bunch of metadata and virtualize, spatialize this audio. It's kind of like the equivalent of recording raw. Yeah, I mean, especially if you did an Ambisonics into 32-bit, then brought that over into the B format. I mean, that is essentially the closest to raw we're ever gonna get. So now once you have this spatialized workstation, you can do whatever you want. You can create a virtualized XY setup. I think the most immersive option would be a virtualized binaural setup, which we've also done on the channel. I love binaural. Now at this point, all you have left to do is export like you would any other session. Just bounce out a stereo wave. And now you've gone from your four analog tracks all the way down to left and right. Left and right binaural. Okay, Andrew, moving on. Question number two from Wade Glass. What is appropriate LUFS, LUFS for YouTube and podcasting, and how do you guys achieve it? Also, please explain to me and everyone else what LUFS are. Yeah, LUFS are interesting. It's a new concept in metering sound. So in the past, we've had peak metering, which is if it rises up to negative six, as soon as it hits negative six on the voltage signal, we meter it and we show it to you. Then we had RMS, which kind of like said, we're gonna ignore the peaks, we're gonna give you a bunch of averages. So if only mm -hmm. the peak hit negative six, but the rest of the dialogue was, was negative 12, we're only gonna show you negative 12. We'll never show you the peak. Then they said, that's not good enough because it doesn't take into consideration the full spectrum analysis and the perceived loudness of different frequencies to the human hearing. Mm -hmm. So what LUFs are, it's RMS plus K weighting, and you end up with LUFs which K weighting, if you're not familiar with the term, it is the uh, Fletcher Munson curve weighted into audio. It is a contoured curve that exemplifies the perceived loudness of different frequencies in the human ear. So when we are hearing things that are lower frequency, they will sound quieter than something that is the exact same volume, but is a higher frequency. Yeah, so they're very, very similar. One is just voltage and one is the perceived loudness of all the frequencies at that voltage. But now you're talking about video in YouTube, which is often like what we're doing, talking mm -hmm. to a camera. Our human voice is like this narrow. So RMS, peak, all perfectly fine. You can forget loops. But if you're doing music and you drop that background music behind a vocal because you want some background music in a corporate video, now all of a sudden you gotta worry about how that music is perceived against the dialogue. A good way of doing this, if you don't want to get too deep into the loofs debate and how that all goes, is you can actually just try to do a DBFS metering of the microphone to negative six, and then your music, try to meter that to like negative 12. That negative six separation is about half the volume because uh, the dialogue is like half the frequencies you're looking at, and you're, you're fine. You're probably gonna be pretty safe there in trying to do that on your premiere metering if you don't have special loof metering. If you have a loof meter, you're looking at like negative 23, negative 24 loof. That's it. It's, it's a little complicated. They all look the same from a distance, but as soon as you know what you're actually like metering, it really does change how you can record audio at the proper levels. Are you sure it's loof and not luff? Ooh, I don't know. Drop a comment in the section below and tell if it's if it loofs or luffs. Now that that's all over, I've now got a question for you that is gonna be hopefully much easier to understand. I hope so. Are there tricks or advice you would give to someone 
Nope, something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm straight up just reading it. I can't even do that. I know. <laughs> Are there tricks or advice you would give to something deceptively easy as room tone? Yes, I can think of two, actually. Number one, microphone orientation. Very important, but the gist of it is that when you're recording room tone, you should ensure that your mic is oriented the exact same way it was when you were recording the production audio. Okay. For example, if you were doing just a standard overhead boom, maybe your mic was pitched downwards at like a 40 degree angle. Yeah. When you're doing room tone, you don't wanna have suddenly holding your mic like a pitchfork and you're pointing straight towards the ceiling. You're gonna be recording all sorts of different reflections. The room is gonna sound entirely different and it's gonna basically render that room tone useless. Yeah. Production will not be happy with you if you go through the extra trouble of recording room tone and you end up not being able to use it. And that same concept also applies to ADR, as we actually learned in our previous episode. Because when you're recording ADR, a lot of the times the instinct is to mount the mic like this, somewhere that's most convenient. But when you're matching the production audio, it's likely that the microphone was pitched like this. Right, it's gonna hit that chest a little bit more. And exactly. Video in the link up in here, this area thing. We did it wrong, so maybe don't watch that one, but. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> but uh, the concept uh, is the same. Is there a second tip you want to give? Yes. The second tip, make sure the second you get into a room where you think you're going to need room tone, you tell the AD. You want to tell somebody who's in control of the schedule that you are going to need a couple of extra minutes before you wrap in this room to record room tone. Because, you know, things get crazy at the end of the day, and you don't want to be the reason that everyone's staying a little bit later for some unexpected thing, especially as annoying as room tone. Yeah, if they can expect it, they, they can, you know, prepare for their quiet for 30 seconds. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Andrew, gonna finish this off with a real easy one from uh, Curtis Judd. I hate you so much right now, Steve. <laughs> Curtis asks, what is output impedance, the microphone specification, and what am I looking for when I read this on a spec sheet? Oh, okay, I actually know this one. Output impedance, you're looking for a microphone that's actually like 200 ohms or below. Ohms is, of course, the measurement of resistance. Now, what that means is the further the signal can go. If you have a high ohm rated microphone, it's not gonna go very far. When we're talking like 20 feet of cable, like that's not a lot. A low ohm microphone with a low ohm cable, you can go incredibly far. And on a film set, you may wanna go like 50 to 100 feet. So I'm looking for microphones that have a low ohm rating. Now, whole time we're talking about this ohm stuff, we're only talking about condensers. As soon as we start talking about things like ribbon microphones and dynamics, it really changes. And you actually wanna be able to adjust the ohm rating of those microphones. There's like these devices with knobs on that can variably switch the ohm rating because it actually changes the tonality of those microphones. Okay. Now, how does it change the tonality though? It actually starts reducing the highs. So the cable itself starts to become like a high cut filter. And that's what you're gonna see also on condenser microphones that are high ohm rated. Now you take that microphone out of the music studio and you then take it into the field. You wanna do a voiceover, but you wanna position yourself, of course, and you just use the same cable as you're using for your boom all day. It's gonna sound completely different than what it did in a recording studio. So this is kind of the same problem that you had with the Joe and Tell episode when you're talking about headphone impedance. Yes. Except just somewhere else in your signal chain. Yeah, absolutely. It's the exact same thing. It's going to affect the way frequencies respond. Cool. The longer the cable, the more high cut is gonna happen and you're gonna lose all your clarity, all your crispness to your audio. It's really gonna get muddy quick. Neat. So, you wanna look for a low ohm microphone. That's why that rating is on the mic. Well, it seems like we've kind of, we've touched a little bit of everything today from post to production to specs. So really kind of a full episode and yeah. I think we're gonna cut it there. Cool. So we just wanna thank you guys for sitting through this one and trugging along because we know this stuff is not always the easiest, but we do our best. But if you've still got some questions, leave them down in that comment section below because we like reading them, we love answering them, and we like to use a couple of them for episodes like this. If this is content though that you do find enjoyable, hit the subscribe button and hit that bell for notifications so you can find out when we post new videos every single week. You are now on Twitter at Deity Steve. It's true. I am on Instagram over at Aunt Andrew Deity Microphone, something like that. Something I don't remember. Andrew underscore from underscore Deity. Yeah, underscores. I like them. And that is it. We're going to wrap this one up. Thank you for watching. Thank you.